Romans chapter 7 and verse 13 through 25. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good. That sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law, that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time. And may we ever be mindful of the absolute privilege it is to be a part of a local assembly. And not just any local assembly, but a local assembly that stands for your word. The right division of your word, recognizing two programs in the scriptures, and therefore keeping them separate, recognizing the similarities that we can learn from and glean from uh, in both programs, and also an assembly that identifies and recognizes a sense of sequence, a order and a soundness to Paul's epistles all the scriptures, but the information directly to us and about us in this dispensation of grace, there is a design, a divine design of godly edification that has purpose and great intent behind it. A purpose so grand, it is your purpose, Father. A purpose to conform us to your image. And in order to conform us to your image, we not only have to be justified unto eternal life, believe that Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again, and when we do, we will receive the forgiveness of all of our sins, past, present, and future. And, in, and you will impute your righteousness unto us and will possess the gift of eternal life. But that is just a means to your purpose, a means to an end. It is not the end itself. But you give us eternal life that we can bring forth fruit unto holiness. And that fruit, the end of it, be everlasting life. That our fruit and the things that we can be involved in in this life will be the only thing that, we can, that can be translated from this life to the next. A purpose that is involved in the heavenly places, in what Paul calls the creature, what you call the creature. And that is a grand purpose. And Father, we need to understand how it is that we conduct ourselves under grace, not under the law. And in order to do that, you set forth much information so that we will not touch that law having a proper understanding why we won't touch that law, not because of what the law is intrinsically of itself, for it is holy, just, and good, but we won't touch that law because we are carnal. We are inherently weak. And Father, as we look at the information, may we come to understand these matters so that we know how to walk in newness of life and serve in newness of spirit. So we give you all the praise, honor, and glory. It's in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Um, again, we are in Romans chapter 7 here. And we are in this final section here in Romans 7. Um, I specifically on my tiptoes uh, in regards to excitement uh, because of what's ahead of us in Romans chapter 8. And um, as you, those who have been with us, what we've been covering thus far is we've learned that we've been planted in the Christ's death and therefore we are also in the likeness of his resurrection and live in the likeness of his resurrection. And since we've been identified in Christ as death, burial, and resurrection, the issue is now being in Christ is we want to tap into 
the grace and the benefits and the opportunity that being in Christ holds out for us. It's one thing to get into Christ. It's another thing to take advantage of what we have in Christ. That's the issue of we have access into this grace wherein we stand. We stand in it, but we have access to it, and we need to take advantage of that, avail ourselves of that. And what Paul's setting forth first, and what he began to deal with in Romans chapter 6, which was months and months ago in, in regards to when we looked at it, from that point on up until the end of chapter 7, uh, he's been covering the issue of not that we aren't able to tap into all that Christ is for us by going under the law. It just does not work. And we've looked at many of the objections to not being under the law. We, and now we're dealing with the misunderstandings. Why one would raise an objection in the first place of not being under the law but being under grace. And we're dealing with the final misunderstanding of that very fact. And, uh, and therefore what we're going to begin to get in chapter 8 and why I'm on my tiptoes. Hopefully you all are too. Um, is because we will leave how we don't live under, uh, under the law, how we don't live under God, be it putting ourselves under the law, to how we actually do live under God, under grace, and how that all plays out, and how that works, and how we participate in that, and what that looks like. And not only that, once that gets underway, well then, God's going to explain to us that He is not only God to us, He's our Father. And that is... Very, very precious. In fact, when Paul sets that forth, he cries, Abba, Father. Uh, he understands what that means. And uh, as any amazing father would do in educating you in his business, he's going to begin to educate us in the grandeur of the glory of his business. And everything that he's going to educate us in is geared towards this end. And he's going to set forth that business as being so grand that we will be willing to go through anything to, to get the education and have that education outwork in the details of our life so that it can be said of us as it was of David that we are we are uh, men and women after God's own heart that whatever it is that he teaches us we will set aside our own thoughts our own emotions our own feelings whatever it may be to get his thoughts to get his feelings to get his affections so that we can be conformed to the image of Christ and that is labor intensive um, because we have something already built up in us, whether it was education from the school system or the education that comes from the world, we have something already, thoughts in our mind regarding the various issues that God is going to touch on. And so we need to have our mind renewed. Well, all that's coming ahead. And, uh, but in order for all that to take place, we cannot put ourselves, or we should not put ourselves under law because all that grandeur all that purpose, all that intent, and the commitment and the responsibility to it on our part will not take place by putting ourselves under law. All that law is going to do is going to work death. And His grace has a lot more in view than death. It is life and abundant life. And so that's what we're covering right now is to not touch that law. Again, we're here, we are here in verse 13. And there's two main issues to deal with this final misunderstanding regarding the law. Again, look at verse 13. He says, was, was then that which is good made death unto me. He just got out of verses <clears throat> 7 through 12, which explained that the law makes us aware and intimately aware of sin in us. And not only that, but the law gives sin functional life in our members. And so the question then comes up that the only time we functionally die and, and, we, and the fruit that we bear unto death is only when we put ourselves under the law. In other words, we are functionally alive. It's not until the law comes or we put ourselves under the law that we functionally die. And that's what he's getting at with this question. Was then that which is good, the law, made death unto me? Is it when you put yourself under the law that it's made death? And he's going to say, God forbid, the reality is we're dead already. We're dead by nature. We're functional. I mean, we, 
we have physical life, but as far as fruit that God can accept and pleases and delights Him, we can't do any of that inherently. And so he says, God forbid, don't think that because it's not made death unto you. It does, the law does give sin functional life in you and, and therefore you functionally die. But it isn't doing that for the first time. And that's how he's going to go on to correct this in the rest of the verse. He's going to go on to say, God forbid, but sin that it might appear sin. There it is. The law comes along and it gives sin functional life, not for the first time. And when I mean functional life in the sense of under the law, I mean it works death in you. Not for the first time, but that it might appear. And who would, why would it have to appear? Who would it appear unto? God? No. He knows what you are. Us. That it might, the law comes along and makes it so that, 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 Sin might appear sin, and that's unto us. That we would know what resides in our members. And here's the kicker. If you think that only is when you're not saved, then you're thinking wrong. Because the reality is, it's still going to do that when you are saved, because you still have sin in your members, and therefore the law is going to call upon your sin. It only recognizes the sin in your members. It does not recognize who you are in Christ. It doesn't come along and say, oh, you're dead to sin, alive unto God, now you can keep this law. It comes along and it recognizes sin in your members and what its design and what its function is, is to make sin appear sin. And we looked at that word appear, that's that conclusive, it's not a vagueness. You don't use the word appear to describe clarity and conclusion. You use it to describe, or, or, or uh, that, that's what you use it for. You use it to describe clarity. And if you, if you say shown or, or something like that, that has all, there's a vagueness to it. Appear is that it becomes evidently apparent and clear to you. It appears sin. It appears for what it is. And so that's the first way in which he's going to correct this. But sin that it might appear sin, working death in me. By that which is good. It's, again, it's not the issue of for the first time it works death in you. Because death has always been working in you. But it's doing that to a greater degree to make it appear to you. And that's the first part of corrective doctrine. Sin is in my members. A sin in my members is what makes me functionally dead. And the law brings that to my full attention. But there's another part of corrective doctrine to all this. In the rest of verse 13, he says that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. And that's the issue of when I try to use the law to control sin, sin always exceeds it. And again, I have to remind us the context that Paul is dealing with is he's utilizing and what he's going to do, he did before and he's going to do it again, he's going to utilize himself. Not as an unbeliever, but one who is justified and sanctified, who has eternal life, who has a grand hope. Paul went through trying to live unto God by putting himself under the law, and this is what he came to. This is what he found. This is what he learned. That when, as a believer, he put himself under the law, sin was made, was made a pure sin, and sin exceeded any best efforts that he had to try to do it himself and functionally live in a God and bring forth fruit and the holiness unto himself. Sin always exceeded that and it became exceeding sinful. He became full of sin. And what Paul's going to do is he's going to prove those two components. He's going to prove that first component there. But sin that it might appear, sin working death in me by that which is good, in verses 15 and 17. And then he's going to prove the corrective doctrine of the second part there in verse 13. That sin by the commandment might become exceeding, exceeding sinful in verses 18 through 25. And what we've been dealing with in the past couple weeks 
not really, because I've been reviewing some of the fundamentals of what we believe at Twin Cities Grace Fellowship, and also there's some newer folks that I wanted to make sure that they understood uh, where, where, where we're at as far as the book of Romans and those things. But we need to look at and began to look at verse 14. And we've already covered the first part there when he says, For we know that the law is spiritual. Uh, I'll give you a pop quiz this morning. You didn't think you were going to get a pop quiz. What is the, the, what is the radical root issue of spiritual? There's three parts to it. Who remembers? If something is spiritual, what does it do or what is it made up of? What's that? Your spirit. It affects your spirit. It affects your mind. That's the very first part of something that's spiritual. When something's spiritual, it affects your mind. It gets into your head to have you start thinking about something. What's the next thing it does after that? What? Motivates. Once it gets into your head and you start thinking upon, upon it, because it's taking up your mind, it's going to motivate you to do what it's doing in your mind. It's going to motivate you. And what's the last part? Produce. It's going to seek to change you. It gets into your mind. It has motivating power. This is the radical issue when you talk about spiritual. Okay? There's different contexts in which you've got to further define it because of the context. But because this is really the first time we went back and looked at it, uses spiritual before. But <clears throat> the first time in the context of, of sanctification really they brings it up. We're looking at the, the very base root issue. And something that's spiritual affects your mind. It's, it's designed to motivate you and it therefore seeks to change you. And we gave the example whether you come out of a, a movie, a very inspirational movie, or you are in front of a, an inspirational speaker, that's what they're going to do. They're going to, through words, or through action, and through emotional appeal, whatever it is, try to affect your mind, usually contrary to what is normal, to affect your mind, to motivate you for change, to do something. Um, usually the political candidates are pretty good at this. And not just one, they're all good at it. That's what they're designed, to, that's what they do. They're trying to affect your mind and motivate you to their end and actually see to its fruition. That's, what, that's the issue of spiritual. Now, as Paul says, we bring that back into the verse, verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual. Now, obviously, we understand that God gave the law. Um, in fact, look at that real quick. Come with me to uh, Acts 7 and Galatians 3. God gave the law, but he gave it through the instrumentality of the angelic realm. His holy angels. The law was a unique covenant in many ways compared to the other covenants, but it's unique in the way in which God gave it. The other covenants were the issue of, I will do this for you. And because it was the issue of God doing it for them, there was no need for, it was, it was just a one party covenant as far as the action. The other party was just the recipients. But the law covenant is not God necessarily acting. It's man acting for God. And in order to recognize and to signify the uniqueness of the law covenant, he did some things in contrast to the other covenants. And one of those is he let the angelic realm handle the law and ordain the law. Look at Acts chapter 7. Stephen's indicting the nation of Israel here. And look what he comes to in verse 51. He says, Ye stiff-necked 
and uncircumcised in your heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have ye not your fathers persecuted, and they have slain them which showed before the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers? And look at verse 53. Who have received the law by the disposition of who? Angels, and have not kept it. The angels were very involved in the time before Mount Sinai and Mount Sinai, and even after that, but they're involved in Israel's program. And part of their involvement was in, in regard to the law. Uh, if you remember, when God supplied the nourishment for the Israelites, for the Hebrews in the wilderness, he gave them what? Manna, Manna which is basically angels' food, angels' bread. And so they're involved in, in, in uh, God's time past deals with the nation of Israel. Look at Galatians chapter 3. And let's pick it up here in verse 19. Paul again is talking about the law. He says, Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions. That's breaking of, of God's commandments. Till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by who? Angels in the hand of a mediator. In other words, you had God on one end, the nation of Israel on the other hand, and on God's end, the meteor was the angels, and on the Israel's hand, the meteor was Moses. And you had this way of which the law was given to show and stipulate the uniqueness and the contrast of this covenant compared to the other ones. He didn't do the, the, the uh, mediate, mediatorship with any of the other covenants because you don't need one. Look what he goes on to say there in verse 20. He says, now a mediator is not a mediator of one. When you have one, you don't need a mediator. He says, but God is one. All the other covenants, he didn't need a mediator because he's one and he's going to do it. But this one, there's two parties involved and therefore they need a mediator. And so that just goes into how the law was different. Now I forgot already why I went into that. But turn back to Romans chapter, oh yeah, now I know. Romans chapter 7. When Paul says in verse 14, for we know that the law is spiritual. Even though the angelic realm was involved in ordaining the law, it was allowed by and, and, and God was involved in the giving of the law. And therefore, it intrinsically is spiritual. Anything that God really does is going to be spiritual. It's, it's going to affect your mind it's going to have some type of motivating power and it's going to seek to change you. And so Paul's coming along, and he's, he's not coming along and saying he doesn't know that the law, he says, for we know that the law is spiritual. And because it is spiritual, it's designed to get in your mind, motivate you, and, and, and produce that change. All right? But if he just stopped there, well, then we could come along and say, well, it's going to do that thing. But he doesn't stop there. There's the rest of the verse. And he goes on, after that colon, he says, but. Adverse conjunction. The law is spiritual. It's designed to affect your mind. It's designed to motivate you and seek to change you. But we, but I am carnal. I love how Paul puts himself in here. I, I read, I, but we are carnal. And that's true, but he says, but I am carnal. Sold under sin. Now you might be thinking, Paul, how, how can you say you're sold under sin? <laughs> Aren't you dead to sin alive unto God? Yep, come back to chapter 6. Chapter 6, verse 11. He says, Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Then look what he goes on to say. Let not sin therefore, what? Reign in your mortal body. Is there a possibility for sin to reign in you? And then he goes on and he says, verse 14, For sin shall not have dominion over you. 
For ye are not under the law, but under grace. What help? That's, that's where God has placed you. What happens if you put yourself under the law? What are you going to give sin? Dominion. You're going to give it dominion. It's going to have dominion in your life. That's what it was, it was designed to do before, and that's its design still now. Again, if we, if God, when we were saved, and if our sanctification involved the eradication of sin from our members, that's a different story. The reality is, sin is still in our members. And so when that law comes into play, again, it's not coming along and recognizing, hey, you're dead to sin, alive unto God. Remember, when we talked about the issue of being dead to sin, we're not dead, as far as physically dead or anything nor is the sin dead. Sin still has power. The issue is, is our unity and our relationship that we had with sin and its mastership over us. That has changed. We're dead to that relationship, but it still exists. And if we put ourselves under the law, dominion, sin, it's going to give sin dominion again, and that's what he's calling, that's what he's hearkening to in chapter, or verse 14 of chapter 7. But I am carnal, sold under sin. Now we are carnal by nature. In fact, that's what carnal means. Again, it can mean different things in different contexts. But in this context, the root, again, that's what I have to get to in this context. The radical root issue of carnal is you are inherently weak. And I got to stipulate this. When I say, and when the scriptures teach, inherently weak, that's not coming along and saying, okay, out of 100%, if we're under 50, then we're weak. We still have 40%, 30, 20, based upon who you're talking about, maybe 1%, maybe some people are better, 49%. We're just not 50 and above, because then we're no longer weak, we have some strength to us. In other words, you can't come along and say, okay, we're 40% weak, and the law comes along and supplies the other 60%, and we're good to go. When he says you're inherently weak, you have no capacity in and of yourself, ourselves, to live unto God. And therefore, that law doesn't come along and change you because it can't change you. Because what was it supposed to do? Manifest your inherent weakness. And therefore, it's not the solution to the problem. It magnifies the problem. To show you and make it appear to you that there is a problem. So when he says, but I am carnal, in contrast to the law being spiritual, the law is something outside yourself. And you are, we are carnal. We are inherently weak. And we have to get this when it comes to our even our sanctification because he made us dead to sin and alive unto him and because he had to do that there's something wrong with us so it's all getting to this main issue and you have to realize through the rest of your life in this body you in this sense are carnal you are inherently weak and because of that fact, if you put yourself under the law, it's going to make your inherent weakness evident. Over and over and over and over again. But God doesn't want to just manifest your inherent weakness. That's not His purpose. His purpose is to display the greatest power in the universe, His grace. And He wants to do it in you. And so He's remedied this. He's provided us the provision that if we avail ourselves of it, we can walk in newness of life, serve in newness of spirit, bring forth fruit unto holiness and end of it, be everlasting life. And it's going to be done even though we are active participants of it, in it. God has made it that even though we're active participants in it, it's not being produced in and of ourselves. It's being produced by him even though we're involved in the equation. 
In other words, he's made you dead to sin, alive unto God. He's made you dead to law that you might be married unto another so that you can bring forth fruit unto holiness. And he's provided you a whole bunch of things that are spiritual, that, that, that are consistent with who he's made you to be in Christ, that when you participate in it, they're also spiritual. They affect your mind. They motivate you. And they really do change you because they're consistent with his grace. It's not the law in you, it's, it's who he's made you to be in Christ and his grace. And that's the recipe with you participating to affect change and to get his plan and purpose done. And because it's that way, we can never come along, and especially with what we're being educated in now, come along and say, the merit goes to me. The merit and the glory and the honor always goes to him. Because without him, without what he did in making us dead to sin, alive unto God, and being dead to law, that we might be married. I, I keep saying it over because those are the things. This, these things are your life now. This is your new reality. And they ought to become such a norm and standard in your mind and in your heart. Because, just like sin was the norm and standard in life before we were saved, that's, this is what ought to become the norm and the standard. And so with what he's done... And, and giving us our new identity. That's just part A. Part B is now walking. We have to have something spiritual, but not the law, because the law doesn't recognize who we are in Christ. But His grace that is also spiritual is going to recognize our new identity, and it's going to work together to produce the ultimate end and result as we participate in it. Now, I try not to do this, but I, I just got to do it. And I've done it before, so it might be just repetitious, but hopefully as we go along and add more to it, that these examples that I do over and over and over again get a little more meat to them. But come with me to chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. By the time we get to Romans 12, we will have covered... What we've already covered, dead to sin, alive unto God, dead to law, that we might be married to another fruit unto holiness, the end of it be everlasting life. And learn that we're not supposed to go under the law. Learn that God's got a curriculum and an education for us that's under his grace, that it's grace working in us, but that we are also participants in it because we have to walk after it. And that begins to get full underway here in Romans chapter 12. And look what he says here in verse 1. He says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. That's the issue of dead to sin, alive unto God. Holy, that's what we're going to learn in chapter 8. Acceptable unto God. That's what we're going to learn at the end of Romans 8. And as we come out of 9, 10, 11. And then he says, which is your reasonable service. And now look what he goes on to say. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your what? There it is. That spiritual thing concept in fact turn back to chapter 8 hold your hand there in chapter 12 look at chapter 8 Romans 8 look at verse 5 for they that are after the flesh that's the issue of trying to live unto God under the law they do what mind the things of the flesh well yeah the law is spiritual so that they're going to be minding those things. But that doesn't recognize, again, who you are in Christ. That just recognizes sin in your members. And not the change that God has made within us. And then he goes on and says, But they that are after the Spirit, the things. And they, that, that's the issue of they mind the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So the issue is that what we're going to be involved in under grace, and as the Spirit leads us, and as we walk after Him... It's going to still affect our mind, but it's of a greater power because of something that God's already done within us. Look at chapter 12 again. It says in verse 2, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Look at verse 3. For I say through the what? Grace, Grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to what? Think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Now, the very first thing we get here in chapter 12, verse 3, 
coincides with everything that we've got in chapter 6, 7, 8 in regards to how we live under grace is it's going to affect our mind to the greater degree than the law could ever do because of our inherent weakness. It always just makes our inherent weakness appear and it becomes exceeding sinful. But his grace deals with sin, actually restrains sin, and it's going to manifest the righteousness, the holiness. And we're participants in it. If we weren't, he wouldn't come along and give you verse 3. Because he's coming along and saying, For I say through the grace given to me to every man that is among you not to think. Who's the one that's not thinking this way? Us. He says not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Now because of verse 12 and everything that he said prior, when he says, And be not conformed to this world, this thinking is godly. This thinking is in contrast to both what the law can provide and what the world can provide. It is unique. Now you might be thinking, as we just read that first part, to every man that is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Well, there's people in the world that think that way. You have people giving the charities. You have people opening the door for other people. You have people who want to invest in other people's lives and all these things, especially if you look at our military who people lay down their lives, they're thinking more highly of other people than their self. But you have to realize, not only is there evil in the world, there's good in the world. The issue is not the good in contrast to evil, the issue is godliness. Thinking the way God thinks. And the world, and the course of this world, charted and created by the adversary, has resident within it a form of godliness. But it's not the very thing, nor does it hold the power of it. And what makes it godly, and not just good thinking, is what the rest of the verse goes along and says. Verse 3, again he says to every man not to think... That is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as who? As God had dealt to every man the measure of faith. When you understand what it means that God had dealt to every man the measure of faith, and you think soberly and selflessly in, in accord with what God has dealt to every man, that's every believer, you now have gone from good, worldly, selfless thinking to godly thinking. And when you start to think that way because of that reason, you're walking after the Spirit. You're being led of the Spirit. You're minding spiritual things. You're walking under His grace. And when that thinking is taking place in your mind, that is a thought compatible and a thought that actually is fruit on the holiness. Because it's not your thinking. And he just says that it can't be the world's thinking. And we know because of 6, 7, 8, it's not the law's spiritual thinking. Because it doesn't provide that. This is grace thinking. This is godly thinking. And so in talking about the law and talking about grace, even jumping ahead a little bit, I try to do those things to make the connection, to give you the flavor and the taste, to keep the appetite wet, dangle the carrot in front of you, of knowing what's ahead. But you need, we need to recognize how this law works and the reality of sin still in us and how those things work together so that we can better understand how God's grace works and when we understand how grace works, that we're not going to confuse the two. And man, are they confused. And I, I, hope you, I hope you tell me, by the time we get done to chapter 7 at least, and if not then, by the time we get done with chapter 8, if you're confused, that if you can't identify these things in your life, which one's law, which one's grace, that you come and tell me. And I'll sit down with you however long it takes till you get it. Because God's purpose is for us not to walk after the flesh. 
He's made everything possible, made every provision possible for us to live under grace and bring forth fruit unto holiness. And not that just to be a small issue in your life, but that to be the prominent issue in your life. And for you to know that it's taking place. God hasn't designed this for it to be vague. You can see what he did with the law. With sin in you, with that law, he wanted to make it appear. Well, why wouldn't he do that with his grace, with who we are in Christ? He wants to make who we are in Christ dead to sin and alive unto him. He wants that to appear by our thinking and the conduct that comes from that thing. He wants to make it evident. Not evident of your salvation, evident with your sanctified position. He wants to put his grace on display. That's where we started in chapter 6. Look at chapter 6 again. Folks, it's, it's grace's time to reign. And the way in which he's choosing to have it reign is through an intelligent understanding in our minds of how it all works to be participants in this process. And that's what got underway. When we learned that where sin abounded, chapter 5, verse 20, grace did much more abound, the issue became, and when he said in verse 17, the abundance of grace we have received, the issue became, what's this all about? What's this abundant grace all about? That's what, it, that's what the issue becomes now that you are saved. The abundance of grace. It's what we titled our cable program, Abounding in Grace. Because that's what it is for believers. And when we got to chapter 6, he said in verse 1, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin? That grace may abound? God forbid. The issue isn't we don't want grace to abound. Is we don't want grace to abound by sin abounding. Sin doesn't abound and then grace abounds. It did that in regard to history when Christ, the Christ dealt with it. But now that we are beneficiaries of that, we can have grace abound apart from sin abounding. And that's one of the reasons why it took us out from under the law. That grace could abound. Well, again, if you are confused after we cover these things... Or it is not crystal clear in your thinking. That's what you ought to, that's first of all what you ought to want it to be. And that's definitely what I want it to be. So let's get it that way. And take the time to do that. That's one of the reasons why, you know, you might be thinking, man, I don't have it up there, but 200 lessons to go through Romans? I don't know how many times in the past of sharing this information with people. One, two, three, four, five, ten times, if not more. And you come back a week later, I'm not talking about you guys. That might be true of some of you guys, but I don't know. You come back a week later, and it's gone. And I don't mean they got a little bit. I mean, it hasn't changed their thinking. And part of the reason why we go the pace we, why I go the pace we do, is to let it become that life-giving force within us. Any education is like that, but when we come to the scriptures, we often don't do that. Is when you become a doctor, a carpenter, a mechanic, any of those type of things, you are spending time with that curriculum and you're spending time with the experience of it so that it becomes like this. In fact, you want a doctor that does that. You don't want a doctor that comes along and says, all right, this person's got a tumor. Ah, what do we do? And God's made it so that we can all be that we can all have doctorates when it comes to who he's made us in Christ and what it means to live under grace. And the reason why we can become that is because he gave us the book. 
and he gave us a local assembly so that these things can be taught and to be had. Now, look back at chapter 7. Again, I just went to chapter 12 to get a flavor of what this is all about. So when Paul says in verse 14, for we know the law is spiritual, but I'm carnal, sold under sin, that's you have to remember what Paul's doing is he's using himself as an example. He's a justified, sanctified believer, but he's gained the understanding because of the time after time he's put himself under the law. Look at that again. Look at verse 9. He says, For I was alive without the law once. And I, when we were there, I noted, it's almost, he says, I was alive without the law once, but it also indicates and applies. There was more times than just one time that he did this. He's just recalling, I was alive without the law once. And so there was a process that Paul went through, just like most of us had to learn, some maybe longer than others, that the way to live unto God is not by law keeping. It's just going to be that cycle, that repetitious cycle of, all right, let's rear up the flesh, try to keep that commandment, and you might run well for a while, especially when you're on that treadmill. You can run for a while. You're not getting anywhere, but you're running for a while. There's something taking place. But eventually, you're going to fall. Eventually, you're going to sin. The law is going to do the very thing it's designed. It's going to make sin that's still in your members appear to you. And it's going to make it exceeding sinful. And you're going to get to that point that Paul's going to get to at the end of when he gets starts verse 20. Oh, wretched man, they have, I'm, ain't I a Christian? Aren't I not supposed to not be doing these things? And then you might stay in that state of pessimism for a week, month, some people a year. Maybe depression sets in. Maybe it's even less than that, but yet there's still that guilt, that condemnation that's there. And then you realize, wait a minute. Didn't Christ die on the cross for what I just did? And so you avail yourself of that provision. He did die for you. Your sins are forgiven. You can actually move on. But you haven't learned anything because you just put yourself back in the law and you start all over again. And God's made it so that that doesn't take place. Not that we aren't going to sin, but that we don't get on the exceeding sinful bandwagon and have a sin appear to us. We're still going to sin, but we are going to be able to, one, restrain it in more times than before, and hopefully that increases. You're never going to be sinlessly perfect, but hopefully that becomes more of your life and ability as you take who God's made you to be in Christ and the further things of the Spirit that He's going to give you to restrain sin and not just restrain it and come along and say, well, what do I do now? But actually do the righteousness, actually do the, bear the fruit unto holiness. And that's, what, that's how God's made it to be. But if you put yourself under the law, you give sin dominion. And that's what Paul's doing. He's the example here. He says, but I am carnal. And as he's talking about being under the law, he says, sold under sin. See, he's carnal. He's inherently weak. But as he puts himself under the law, he's sold under sin. And when you're sold, when you, when you go and purchase something, it's on sale and the other person, it's, it's sold, they sell it, right? That's what sold is, the past tense of sell. They sell and it's and sold, that possession. Whoever has now in their possession, you're under its dominion. And that's why he's, exactly what he said. It's interesting that what you have here in Romans chapter 7, verse 14, lines up with Romans chapter 6, verse 14. That for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under law but under grace. And Paul comes along and get, show, shares himself as an example of being under law. And he says, I'm sold. But I am Carl, sold under sin. Now again, there's provision for that. But that's the state we can be in. Now there might be more thinking. This may be not that crystal clear in your mind. So 
I want to try to draw it for you. I always get really nervous when I'm drawing something because I don't, it, it's, it's that balance of I could make this more confusing <laughs> or I can make it clear. So if it starts to become confusing, just do, do me a favor, close your eyes and, and we'll go from there. Again, this is just a setup verse for when he begins to prove it in verses 15 all the way down. Um, but I think it's important just to recognize this so we keep it in its, its context, okay? Now, I'm going to draw two figures here. But you have to imagine this is really just one, all right? This is really just one figure. I'm trying to represent the carnal aspect and our new identity, but that we are both carnal, inherently weak, and we both have a new identity in this same body. Okay? So I'm trying to signify that. Now, let's deal with it this way. Before we were justified and sanctified, we were alive to sin and dead unto God. Alright? Part of our identity, alive to sin and dead unto God, not only was our identity, but we actually, we had, and we still do, sin in our members. That was the outworking of our identity, right? We're dead, we're alive to sin, and therefore what we produced was sin. It was in our members, and that's what we, that's what we produced. When we became justified and sanctified, that changed, and we learned that in Romans 6 there, that we are dead to sin and alive unto God. So that changed. But something didn't change. Sin in our members. Now when is that going to change? A rapture. When you get a new body, right? Sin will finally be taken out of these bodies. And we'll get a new body. What glorious day will that be? But in the meantime, God's given us the provision... To manifest his grace that it's greater than sin that still resides in us and that is able to be put on display by us because one he made us dead to sin and alive unto him and and much more but here's where the rub comes in here's what we've been dealing with when we before we were justified and sanctified try to either earn our justification and our sanctification and all those things by doing the works of the law, as we've been learning in also Romans 7, and we learned prior in Romans 3 and those type of things, that the law makes this what? Alive. And it makes it appear, right? And exceeding sinful. For us to be conclusively aware of what is in us. But what I want you to see is that law, it bypasses this. It bypassed our identity before, that we were alive to sin. It just bypassed that, and it's like it went right to sin in our members, and it made it work. It was the motions of sin. Now it does that same thing now that we're over, we're over here as it were, under, and you put yourself under the law, that law, what it's going to do is it's going to bypass your new identity. And because sin is still in your members, it goes right there. And it goes right to work. And that's the parallel. Over here, sin had dominion over us. Not only in a practical manner, but in this, in an in identity manner, we were alive to it. 
God's initial grace for us changed that identity, made us dead to sin. And it also is going to, his, we're going to be under grace, it's going to deal with this. Okay? So there's provision for both. But when the law comes in both here and makes it appear and it comes exceeding sinful, and as a Christian, when you put yourself under the law, it bypasses your new identity and it starts working in this, what ends up going to happen is it's going to seem like you're back over here. Remember, your new identity, you have to reckon that to be true. You don't feel it. You don't experience it. Um, when, when, when you get it in those type of things, you don't sense it. You've got to reckon it. You've got to take God's word for what it is and say, that's true. That's my new reality. But you don't come along. You don't have a outward certificate saying you're dead to sin, alive unto God or anything. Those type of things that God gives. It's something that's on the pages of God's word and that we have to believe inwardly that that's actually what took place. And we're well acquainted, talking to Brother Mike before us, we're well acquainted with sin. We've been doing that for all our lives before we're saved. And so when, that's, when sin happens, especially under that law, it's going to seem like you're right back over here. In all reality, you're not back over here. You're not alive to sin and dead unto God. You're still dead to sin, alive unto God. But the law, because it bypasses all of that, it just focuses on sin in your members. And therefore, it's going to appear to you. That's why you're going to... When the law came into play over here and started working on sin in the members, when it made it appear, it was making, it appear, making this appear, that who you are inherently... God has made it so that you're focused on who he's now made you to be. And so, but if you put yourself in the law, it's going to appear you're going to become exceeding sinful. And folks, that can all take place. And because God changed this, this identity, you can still be a Christian. When you live under the law, it deceives you. Exactly, that's what we learned. Yep, that's exactly what it's doing. Part of that deception, when it starts working in, with sin in our members, the deception is having you think that you're here, that you're still in this, predic you're still in this predicament. When you're not, you're over here. Uh, it deceives in a whole host of ways, but that's one of the ways it deceives. Yep. Does that make sense? All right, because what Paul's going to be talking about He's not talking about over here under the law and sin appearing and those type of things. He's talking about as a believer. And he, when he talks about the issue of sold under sin there, he's not talking about this changing. That can't change. He's talking about this and that increasing, that appearing, and that basically working more than who he's made you to be in Christ. Because your focus and what's working is sin in our members. Now, not only did God change our new identity, right? May it's dead to sin alive in God. But the remedy, the ultimate remedy for sin in our body is obviously a new body. But in the meantime, the remedy for sin in our members is our new identity. See, the law bypasses all that. God deals with that. And it's that very thing that the law bypasses, which is why it's weak. It bypasses all that. Our new identity deals with that sin in our members, as well as, and grace is going to come along as we're under it, as we walk after it, and it's going to continue to weed out and deal with sin in our members. Any questions regarding that? Mike? It changes your thinking. You wonder the law. You're not thinking about what God is doing you and how it affects you and all of that. Your thinking is about you're breaking the law. Yep. And, and that you, that what you said about you go back on it is almost the same as before you got saved. You start to think, well, Nothing's changed. I'm yeah. still that same 
especially to a person who is brand new. Yep. He thinks nothing's changed. Yep. Yep. Exactly. See, Great comment. Like I think, like ninety-five percent of Christians do this. Yeah, that's that's they, that's. They, they, they become born again. They accept Christ, and they, they come out of the gate, and then they just stand there. Yep. Yep. And the and the job that we have. And the job that we have is we have to recognize and be sensitive with that. He brought up that that's the way most Christians are. And probably most of us have come from that back. And you have to remember, who's the one utilizing himself as a sample here? Paul. So this is something that is not, this is, this is instruction. Instruction is information you don't innately know. And he knows the law is spiritual, but I am carnal. But when you become a Christian, you, you, you learn these things. You learn that. Um, as far as myself, that took me, that took me, maybe not as much as some other folks, but that took me years. Especially when you're in covenant theology. By the name alone, covenant theology, you're involved with the law. And you're involved in the continuation of Israel's program. You're fulfilled of that. And so you're always putting yourself under that system. And you're constantly on that cycle. And you're constantly bearing witness with what Paul's saying in Romans 7, but you can never get to Romans 8. And that's what Paul's, that's what Paul's teaching. So he sets forth Romans 6, our new identity, dead to sin, alive unto God. That, as well as under his grace, which is going to be what, what we're under and what we, should rem we practically should remain under as we walk, all right? That is going to deal with sin in our members, all right? But if you put yourself under the law, the law does not recognize your new identity. It goes straight to sin in our members, and because what it's designed to do, it's not, it is designed to change you, but it's recognizing who you are inherently, you're inherently weak. See, it bypasses who he's made you to be, and it's focusing on what's in you, which is you're inherently, you're inherently weak. And what it does then, it makes it a sin appear, you become exceeding sinful, you bring forth that fruit, fruit unto death. And so Paul's going to, and that's, that's, he's going to get to it, that old wretched man concept. And we'll, we'll see this more as we, at what Paul's going to do now in verse 15, we'll start next session, 15 hour, he's going to prove that. He set it forth in verse 13, and, he, he, and then he set the stage even further in verse 14, and now he's going to prove it. And what we have to remain in the context of is, is Paul is a justified, sanctified believer, but he's not, he's not comparing the old nature to the new nature. Okay? He's not comparing the old nature to the new nature, that once he's out and then he's in and out and in. He's, he's in. The, 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 the new identity is assumed. When he says, I am carnal, he's talking about who he is as a justified, sanctified believer. He's still inherently weak because he still has sin in his members. What he's going to do is talk about when that law comes, what it focuses upon. It focuses upon his carnality. It's one of the reasons why when the law comes along, what it's, it's going to make it appear to you. And because it's, the law is spiritual, it's going to affect you and you're going to be thinking carnally. You're going to be, what's going to be made evident to you is your inherent weakness. And he doesn't want you to be thinking about your inherent weakness. He wants you to be thinking spiritually. The law doesn't provide that, but his grace is going to provide that spiritual thinking. Well, we've got we to gotta conclude here. Again, if there's still some vagueness regarding that, the proofs that Paul sets forth are going to help, and then we can, we can go from there. But I'll conclude in prayer, and then we're going to pick it up in verse 15 in the second session. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time to get into your word, to begin to grasp if it is for the first time or to review what Paul's setting forth here in Romans 7. 
so that we know the mechanics of sin still in our members and the law coming along and giving that credence, giving that functional life and it producing death in us. And that it makes a sin appear and it, we become exceeding sinful. That can all take place under the law because sin still resides in our members. Even the law is spiritual, but I am carnal soul under sin. And therefore what needed to take place is exactly what you provided for us. We become dead to sin and alive unto God. And it's that what we need to reckon. It's that what we need to mind. It's that what we need to walk after, as well as the abundance of grace that you have yet waiting for us to restrain sin in our life and to live unto you and to do it your way and to do it with the things that you want us to think about as you teach it to us in your word. So Father, we thank you that your hand is before and after us. Your hand, not your supernatural, omnipotent hand, but what you did for us and how you describe it in the effectual working of your word. And therefore, we can learn these things and actually live under your grace, actually bear fruit unto holiness, and actually not experience the condemnation that is so experienced by Christians when they put themselves under the law. So, Father, we thank you for all the provisions that we've become beneficiaries of because not who we are, not because of what we've done, but because of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, I do pray if someone here listening again, the very first thing that they need to get settled is dealing with the accumulation of their sin and who they are by nature. And the way in which they do that is by believing in the cross work of the Lord Jesus Christ, how that he paid for the debt penalty of their sins, was buried and rose again to offer that payment to them as a free gift. And the way in which they receive this free gift of salvation from the debt penalty of their sins is by faith and faith alone. The moment they believe, they'll have the forgiveness of all their sins, past, present, future. They'll have your righteousness imputed unto them, and they will therefore possess the gift of eternal life. May they believe this very moment. And once they do, may they learn these truths because it's these truths that establish them to have a life walking in newness of life. And Father, we thank you for this time of grace giving. We don't give grudgingly or on necessity. We give in response to the very things we've covered already and, and what we've covered today. We give in response to your grace and the provisions you've made so that these things can be continued to be taught here, that they can exceed these walls, and that we can sustain as you give us this privilege as adults to sustain the abundance of grace, to see the victory over sin and death. And so, Father, we thank you for all the things that you've given us, and we give it according as every man purposeth in his own heart. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.